All right, Dana, uh, that's it from me. I'm going to pass things over to you to give a quick intro of yourself and then pass it on over to Nick and Hillman before we dive in. All right. Sounds good. Of course, my dog is freaking out in the background, so I'll apologize already for the barking that may occur in a couple of minutes. Um, but I'm Dana Mirabella. I'm the VP of Customer Success at Salescreen. We're a sales gamification platform that helps make work more exciting and fun. And we work primarily with sales leaders making those day-to-day -day activities um, kind of competitive so that it really impacts your bottom line. So this is something that I talk to customers about all the time. Always, where's my pipeline? How am I going to hit my goal? I can't believe it's already end of the quarter. Um, so really excited to talk about this topic and also to have Hillman and Nick join me and I'll let them introduce themselves before we get started. So Hillman, you want to kick us off? Yeah, sure. I love this active chat. This is fantastic. Uh, my name is Hillman Sori. I'm the co-founder of Coach CRM, where we are endeavoring to make coaching a competitive advantage for sales teams. I'm also the co-founder of Closed Loop Sales Management Consulting Firm. And uh, this is this is what we do. This is what I live and breathe all day long. So I'm excited to have the conversation. Looking forward to the folks who are participating, kicking in their thoughts and chat so that this is highly tailored to what you showed up to get out of this conversation. Nick? Thank you. Yeah, my, so my name is Nick Sproul. I head up uh, our uh, SDR operations at Second Nature. Uh, we're a sales coaching, sales training platform um, specializing in two-way AI conversations. So think of us as the batting practice before the game, and Gong is kind of your post-game film. Um, so I'm very excited to kind of talk through this, and sales coaching is kind of um, a passion of mine, just given by the nature of the product that me and my team uh, get to sell every day. Awesome. All right. Lots of different roles in the chat, ton of different locations, Italy, Philippines, Cyprus. So we definitely have a unique crowd. And like Savannah said, we really want you guys to be active in the chat. Please answer questions, ask questions, provide comments. I'll be monitoring it as well as Savannah as we have um, this talk, but really want it to be interactive and include any thoughts or questions that are top of mind for you. Ultimately, this is what you get out of it. Um, so we're happy to pivot however we need to. So we're already moving into the end of the year, which is crazy. There are, you know, just a little over three months left of 2022. And everyone is thinking about how they're going to hit their target, close out the year, beat last year, um, really driving consistency with those activities, especially as the holiday comes up and there's just so many things going on. So Nick, maybe you can kick us off with just some of the ways you motivate your team to keep their activities and pipeline building up when there seems to be so much happening around us. How do you really keep your team focused? Yeah. Um, for me, I've always been, uh, even as an SDR is very analytical and made the data kind of my friend. Um, so I'm always looking for new ways for us to engage with prospects and customers. Um, so close lost uh, or any ones that we've nurtured, those are always good ones because those are going to be warmer conversations. Um, even if they're not going to buy from you right now, at least that can help build up the rep's confidence by having a conversation with someone that's actually familiar with your product and maybe went through a sales cycle and just timing might not have been right. Um, outside of that, yeah, we're, uh, we recently launched some account scoring, which kind of allows us to prioritize a little bit better. Um, it seems right now that sales coaching seems to be a hot topic in the market. Uh, so we're definitely having some really good conversations, but, um, and actually Rosalind St. Elena posted this this morning about making data kind of your friend. So you want the data to be your friend, making sure that your CRM is clean, your sales enablement platform keeping notes on, on your prospects will definitely help, um, especially when we get closer to the end of the year. Awesome. So for those of you in the audience, Nick's kind of tips and tricks there, one included account scoring. So if you're doing that, please put a number one in there so we can kind of see if that's familiar. And going back to the closed losses, I love that. So if that's something that you're also planning for the end of the year, drop a number two in there so we can see if that's also common. And if there's something that like you're super excited about that you're trying, feel free to go random and drop it in the chat and we'll kind of take a look at that. As Hillman kicks us off with kind of switching gears a little bit, right from the IC to the managers, you're coaching managers and ICs all the time. Um, 
Do you have anything to add to Nick's kind of response on something that you feel has really worked for you or worked for your clients that you want to share with the group? Well, first off, generally, I love the idea of, of making data your friend, right? Uh, and there's so much data these days. You have so many different systems that they're all churning up different dashboards. The dashboard is kind of brass tacks for B2B SaaS software. So you might be managing multiple dashboards. And it's really important to understand what data is important for your organization um, from, from a coaching perspective and from a sales leadership perspective. I also love that Nick said, you know, make sure your CRM data is clean. Like I, I've never seen that be the case. I think it's absolutely something that's best practices, but um, I, I have yet to see in the thousands, literally thousands of companies I've worked in, unless they have just rolled out a CRM where that CRM hygiene is really where it needs to be. But yeah, the degree to which you can do that effectively, I think is important. Breaking it down to like what you are doing doing on a daily basis. I think that Dana, you led off by saying, you know, in this world where we've got three months left and, you know, you're dealing with war, you're dealing with post COVID, hopefully we're post COVID, right? You're dealing with so many things in the news. We're dealing with, is it a recession? Is it not a recession? It's an inflationary economy, all these types of things happening. I'm working from home. There's a quitter thing, all this stuff, right? It can be very easy for you to just get lost in the chaos, right? And I'm a huge fan, whether you're an IC or whether you're a leader, and both for yourself, if you're a leader, and for your team, of managing what you can control. In leadership, the onus is on you to kind of set the vision and keep folks focused, narrow focused, keep the aperture really tight on the things that they can control. I'm a huge fan of marginal gains theory, right? Where 1% impact every day, 1% better each day in aggregate correlates to a really huge impact at the end of some periodic, you know, so some period of time. So looking at what you can control within the scope of your job to be done is what's critical. It's the only thing that you can actually do in a given day. So whether that's a certain amount of activity, whether it's quality, whether it's quantity, whatever it might be, the extent to which you can define what that's going to be on a daily basis gives you successive wins. You talk about how do you motivate a team? A team is motivated by success right? You can't make success a balloon payment that occurs at the end of the quarter, end of, a, end of a month, end of a year. Success has to be something that we hearken back to on a daily basis. And that's how you create that culture that becomes like a flywheel and keeps things moving forward. Um, so those are a couple pieces in abstract that I think are critically important. Yeah. I love that 1%, right? Like I think sometimes whether you're a sales leader or you're an SDR or an AE, you know, to your point, you get overwhelmed by the chaos and your to-do yeah. list seems to grow so much. And if you just focus on one thing per day, I tell my team this all the time, like block your calendar and just do one thing, right? Like if you complete one thing today, you'll feel so successful. And I feel like as managers, every single one of us have probably said like, celebrate the at-bats. Like to your point, yeah. that balloon payment isn't going to make you feel great every single day. So how do you celebrate those like small activities that eventually will add up to that huge balloon payment? And you're like, wow, I know exactly how I got here, which is like amazing for someone to see that progression day over day or week over week. But to your point, wait until the end of the quarter can kind of be deflating in some ways for sure. And then another piece to that, if I could just add there, is that to, to your point, you have that success, you realize what created that success, you rinse and you repeat, and then this becomes something that's muscle memory and you can move on to the next bigger thing, right? You create the habit loop and that habit loop correlates to this really massive impact over a period of time. And you keep creating additional habits that create a, a really solid, uh, really solid performance over a significant period of time. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay. So now that we've kind of talked about like the 1%, kind of these three things that Nick and his team are doing, he even added a fourth in there with sales navigator intent. Um, you know, those are kind of the behaviors, but it is hard to drive accountability, right? When we think about like, we all know in some cases what it takes to do the job, right? Like you're an SDR, you're making calls, you're booking meetings, you're an AE, you're moving opportunities. And it, and it sounds like you could just do it, but sometimes it is hard to really think about how you drive that accountability. I struggle with this with my own team sometimes, especially at the end of the year with so much going on. So I'm going to throw it back to Hillman and just say, like, when you think about all the I, the things that I see may be able to drive or is trying to drive, what are some of the tricks that they may be able to do to, like, hold themselves accountable, right? Like, you gave them this great 1% idea. Yeah. Um, but is there anything else that you can kind of share that might help them move the needle? You know, I'm a huge fan of acronyms. Um, and I look at coach 
as an acronym. And this is something that we, we have rolled out to um, managers. It's something that also could be really impactful for you as an individual, as you think about how you're going to go about your day and how, where you're going to expend your energy. One thing to your point, there's so many things that you could be doing, so many things that you could be impacting. If you're going to take off a big challenge, the idea is try to find something that is going to have a significant impact as a domino effect, right? So instead of taking all the 50 things that you could be doing at any given time, evaluate what those 50 things are and say, you know, this one thing, if I were able to nail this on a consistent basis and perform at this um, at a higher, higher level of impact, then that is actually going to have a significant impact on my results throughout all of my performance, right? So identifying that one challenge, it's kind of the idea of like, even in a manager's role, you can't throw 10 tennis balls at somebody and expect them to catch it. It's not gonna happen effectively, right? So figure out what that one thing is, and that might take some time and some evaluation, might take some talking to mentors or talking to peers. Then once you've identified that thing, you've gotta understand from a coaching perspective, it's all about the gap, right? Coaching is about moving performance from where it is today to where you'd like it to be. Well, you got to identify where you want to be. What does success look like? And then outlining that path to success by reverse engineering, saying, okay, if this is the ideal, then the step before the ideal looks like this. The step to get there is that. And then, oh, the thing I need to do tomorrow is be able to do this thing impactfully. Then you develop an action plan. And that action plan could be something as casual as setting down the specific behaviors that you're going to do on a given basis or something even more formal like an OKR or, or a KPI or even SMART goals, if people are familiar with that acronym. Choose whatever your jam is, whatever the thing is that is easy for you to do and that you have, at this point in your life, done successfully before. This is the upshot of anybody who's in a sales role today. You got there because you were hired because you've, you've, you've demonstrated some success previously. You've had some performance success, whether it's academically, whether it's in a previous role, whether it's um, uh, athletically, whatever it might be, you already have in your brain that track worn that shows how Hillman goes and performs, how Hillman goes and learns, how Hillman adapts new habits, right? Go back to that. Don't start something that new. Go back to what's worked with you before. Understanding the consequences, that's the, the, the second C in coach, right? Consequences don't have to be draconian. They don't even have to be negative. A consequence could be, hey, I hit my number. A consequence could be, hey, I ramp more quickly. A consequence could be, hey, I'm in line for a promotion because I've demonstrated successive quarters of, uh, of, of hitting my goal, right? Whatever it might be, understand the consequences because those that's the why. That's what's going to get you up every day, get you motivated every day, get you in the seat doing the behavior every day. And in the absence of that, it's very easy to feel like you're just a cog in the wheel in an organization and you're just doing my thing, trying to hit a number you know, with, with, in a thankful role where you're getting rejected more than half the time, right? And then finally is that last piece that you asked about, which is how do you hold yourself accountable? Um, I think one great way to hold yourself accountable is to share the challenge with folks on your team who are supportive. It could be a manager, it could be a mentor, it could be a peer in another part of the organization. Once you've kind of spoken it, it now exists, and there are people there who are going to be supportive for you. I'm also a huge fan, you know, I've got, I, I log into probably 10 to 15 different types of accounts every day. I make my password, my short-term challenge or goal, whatever, or, or the action plan that I'm trying to complete. So that every time I type it, it's a realization that I've got to do something with it. Again, most people have their own means of doing these things. Don't go net new, go for what's worked for you. But I see coach as an acronym and you can apply this either to your team or you can apply it to yourself as an individual. Yep. Awesome. I love that. Um, I'm going to stop the share so everyone can see our faces again. I think um, the really cool thing that you call out there that I think so many SDRs and AEs sometimes forget, especially in the times when they're frustrated, is like they know their plan, right? Like they know why they were hired. They know what they're good at. They know what works for them. And I tell my team that all the time, like I'm here to guide you, but like you as an individual, like if what I'm saying doesn't jive with you or you feel like there's a better path do it. I'm not, right. I don't care. I just want you to hit the results and feel successful. And I think so many times people forget that and get stuck in what they're supposed to do and forget that it's like within you, right? Like I love the action plan that you can set up for yourself. You know what you're capable every day. If the goal is 10 calls and you want to make 20, do it. If the right. goal is 10 calls and you're not feeling it today, do 20 tomorrow, right? That's I think there's some ways <laughs> that you can like play with your own motivation and your own skill set that help you to feel like the action plan makes sense for you. And so many times we forget that. So I love that call out. I think for me, that's going to be like my biggest takeaway. 
Um, and I tell my team that, right. And I think as us as an individual, like challenge your manager, like, Hey, I don't think it's going to work for me. I'm going to do it this way. I still think I'm going to get to the result. Does that sound good to you? Like most managers are going to say, yeah, because you're still going to get to the result, which I think is great. Can I add one thing there, Dana, that I think is really important um, that I've, I've coached a lot of folks on is sometimes we sit and we wait for the motivation and motivation is hard. Habit is easy. If I'm in the habit of going to the gym every day at 2 p.m., then that becomes something that I just do. And then I begin to reap the benefits of having done that, whether it's a dopamine hit, whether it's fitness, whether it's health, whatever it might be. I am seldom motivated at 2 p.m. to get up from my desk and march over and go to the... Never, right? If I waited for that, then it just wouldn't happen. So the real key is to create those habit loops so that you just sink into it on a regular basis. And then what you'll find is because you've created the habit, you're actually reaping the the reward of the result. And that result is what actually becomes the motivation to continue to do things. Yep. I love that. Um, Nick, what do you kind of use in the same kind of realm around like holding yourself accountable or your team accountable? Do you have any other best practices or tips and tricks that you can share with the group? Yeah. Um, we use uh, what we call an effective day scorecard. Um, so an SDR is not going to book a meeting every day. That's just just how it works. Um, so you got to have some other things that can kind of boost up your morale and, and, and your confidence. So we have kind of six kind of points that we look at. So that's how many new contacts did you add into uh, your sequences Um, How many conversations did you have? Uh, Obviously, how many meetings did you book? Did you, did any deals get generated? Um, And did you spend any time on on professional development? So there's, there's basically a point for each and your goal is to to get to eight at the end of the day. Um, And we like, and we can kind of gamify that as well. Um, In addition to that, especially around the holiday time, it can be hard to reach people. So really going back to the basics. And for us, that's really uh, getting into our tool, going through our different simulations, and that can really kind of boost your confidence. Like, hey, I did this training. I got a 99 on it. So I'm, now I'm ready to get back at it and get back on the phones. So those are a couple of things that uh, I like to kind of instill my team and do, do here at Second Nature that, uh, that really helps us out and stay yeah. accountable. Yeah, I love that. Um, I think, you know, I struggle with the accountability piece. And one thing that I've really learned at sales screen has been like each member of my team is different, right? Which is why I love Wilhelm and kind of called that out. Like your goals are different. Your skill set is different. Or even like Nick's point, right? Everyone's going to come up with their own points, right? Maybe it's not a meeting and you rather focus on calls today, but you still get the eight points for that scorecard. The other thing that we really try to focus on internally and also with our customer base um, are these kind of like four cogs, right. That like help us think about the individuals. So like some people on my team are very visual, right. And they just want to see the leaderboard or the scoreboard, the scorecard of, okay, I'm at six points. I need to get to eight points or there's milestones that they want to know they're close to hitting. And then we'll celebrate those milestones, but they need to like, see it. Right. Other people on the team want to compete about everything, right? Like I'm, you know, you have those killers on your team. That's their profile. They want to be the best, beat the people on the team, be number one all the time. And there's obviously competitions and spiffs that you can do there that definitely hold your team accountable. And then similar to what we said with the visualization, there's milestones or like achievements. Like you made the most calls you've ever made this week. And it, you know, they love that they're competing against their own intrinsic motivation that comes from within. And they, not that they don't care about the team around them, but they know they're trying to beat their own goal. And then I think something that we haven't talked about that is definitely missing from some people's kind of vocabulary or maybe like their day-to-day, it's just not a habit, right? Like we're so focused on the goal and the activity and how we're going to hit our target that we do forget to celebrate or recognize those at bats. Right. And I think Mm -hmm. for your middle performers, this is so important because when you're kind of sitting in the middle, right, there's always going to be that killer, that number one, who's always on top, always crushes it, always kills it. When you're more in that middle field, or even sometimes when you're in the bottom and you're really trying to push yourself to perform, you want to be celebrated and recognized. And that also means different things for different people, right? Like 
Some people want prizes and they're like, again, money motivated, right? And that is how they think about winning competitions or spiffs, or if they get that badge, maybe it's like a, you know, a plaque or something that also comes with a monetary prize. But there's also just like endorsements, like, hey, great job this week. You could share it in Slack or whatever the team channel is, especially now that we're in this half remote environment. Um, where you really call out that success from someone as a manager or encourage your team to think about like shout outs through one another, right? Like we used to do this rock the house award every week and it didn't come from management. It came from individuals on the field, calling out other individuals in the field. So I encourage you all to think about this, whether you're an AE, an SDR or a manager, how do we think about like what those expectations are for you, whether it's a scorecard or that 1% activity that you're trying to do, like what do you need to feel that accountability or motivation? Is it like the visual parts of it? Do you love to compete? How do you want to be recognized? And especially with the end of your craziness, like don't be afraid to tell your manager, hey, I need a little bit more in this, right? Or as a manager, ask your team, am I giving you guys enough to hold yourselves accountable? Do you feel like these goals are attainable? How can I help? How can I motivate you? It could be as simple as like a leaderboard, right? Like go back old school style and and put the whiteboard up and put it behind you and every team meeting talk about it there's a, you know a million ways that you can do this with or without technology that could really help to motivate your teams hey dana question for you um the rock the house is that done through slack do, you, do you, first off do you have a distributed workforce and are folks working from home and remote or hybrid that's the first question and how you're doing that and i'd also love to know from folks who are in the chat what they're doing in their orgs to kind of keep that cohesive team collaboration thing happening if they do have a hybrid or a, a work from home type of a sales team. I'm always curious how that's working out for folks. Yeah. For us at Sales Screen, it's, it's more remote than, than ever, right? And we're an international company. So the majority of our workforce actually sits in Europe, whether it be in Norway or Barcelona. And then across the US, we're kind of spread out all over the place. So I would say we're majority remote for sure. Um, and the way that we do that and rock the house didn't happen at sales screen, but now I think I'm going to have to bring it to sales screen, especially after this. <laughs> um, but what we do do at sales screen, like we use our own platform, right? Like we kind of drink our own Kool-Aid and there's things that we can do there to help in our all hands meetings. We do an all hands every Friday. Our CEO calls out the achievements that each person has done or achieve mm -hmm. those milestones, right? So you get a badge in the platform, it shows up in the feed, and then we also have a way that you can download it so you can pull it into your slides for your all-hands meetings. And even more, like the IC can push it out to LinkedIn. So for those who are like cool. more socialites, right, and like love the likes, the comments, they kind of want to show it, that's their pair, player profile, and, and that's totally fine, they can push it out to LinkedIn. So that's how we celebrate kind of those milestones that like we as a management team are setting. But we also have endorsements through the platform where the ICs can call out one another. And it happens all the time, like AE to CSM, SDR to AE, like just calling it out or even like random R&D. Hey, heard that the sales conversation happened in the office. This was amazing. Or like saw the notes in sales screen that you just closed an opportunity. Way to go, dude. Here's 50 coins, right? And we kind of nice. have a mix of both. Um, so we try to do it in multiple ways where it's happening in the platform organically. When that actually happens, it's definitely a leadership priority. So for the managers on the call, like if your leaders, like if your executive team isn't calling this stuff out, make them do it. Shout from the rooftops, especially in Q4. You'd be surprised what an executive call out does to an IC's motivation. Like knowing that those that call mattered, that deal mattered, it really does go such a long way. Um, but think about, you know, Rock the House Awards at my previous job was literally in an all hands meeting. The first five minutes, raise your hand if you want to give someone a Rock the House shout out. There's, nice. You know, like, there's nothing else that came with it other than like you got to call out your peer in a all hands meeting and everyone heard it and clapped after. And it was a hit. Very cool. Sounds like Petra would agree with you in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Any other, I know that you also asked the audience, we're seeing Petra um, agreeing here, ringing a bell is an old school one, right? Like ring the gong and you can do that 
in Slack remotely with a video or a GIF or something, you know, every time it happens to your sales team, maybe there's a video that posts. Um, there's so many of those things you could do still in a remote environment. Any other ones? Should we give the people in the chat? I know it's Thursday afternoon, almost Friday for some of us, some of you very late at night who are joining us from Europe. Okay. So the other thing that we definitely have focused on and it has come up already is how important data is, right? Like the data cleanup, looking at your closed loss, which you have to have clean data. So overall, like the data is so important in the pipeline and activity management, both for you as an individual, if it's something that you're tracking towards and for your managers. Um, so what are some of those like best practices of data sources or adjusting your strategy using data with enough time to drive an impact um, that you've kind of coached people on Haman, in the in the past, right? Like, is there anything that you've ever done or seen someone, you know, really push that was like, wow, you went from A to B so quickly and here's how you use data? Yeah, <laughs> I, I love the question. I'm also noticing uh, Joe Cortez dropped something only to the host and panelists that I think the, the rest of everybody would laugh at with respect to how, how they cheer people on. We have a James Brown two-foot figurine that sings, wow, I feel good, but the sales rep gets to hit when they close a deal over a certain dollar amount. That is awesome. Ooh, that's an upgrade right, I couldn't, I couldn't let that go. Sure. We didn't hit everyone. It just went to the panelists, so I had to share that. Thank you. Um, so back to your question with respect to data. So a couple of things that I think about, um, again, I said earlier, there are so many data sources. It's almost overwhelming. You know, how many dashboards and how many pieces of either anic data or, um, you know, you've sometimes got vanity metrics, you've got all these other things that are just kind of out there. And then you've got what you need to run the business. And the onus is on someone in the organization. Maybe it's someone who's in operations. Maybe it's someone who's enablement. Maybe it's a manager, depending upon the size of the company. And, and also, obviously, each individual needs to understand the data for their patch and what they're trying to achieve. But you got to have a single source of truth. And to Nick's point, that single source of truth has to be reliable. And that reliability falls directly to that garbage in, garbage out thing. You've got to be able to ensure that what you're asking your sales team to input is relevant, first of all, is going to be reflected back to them in a way where it's like, I'm inputting this data. Am I just doing this for management? Or is there some way in which this is clearing the path and shining the light on the things that I need to be doing, right? And then it has to be something that I can do in workflow, right? You can't park data as that thing that I have to do when I'm you know, watching a game on Sunday, Sunday evening, and then it's ex post facto, and I'm kind of trying to remember some narrative. The last piece here is it needs to be structured. Right. Anybody who leverages data for any sort of reporting understands that unstructured data has, you know, limited efficacy. So the goal here is to take all that and to synthesize it into something that's really just keep it as simple as you possibly can that allows for you to be able to manage the business going forward. Based upon that, you've got to be able to make some sort of hypothesis. Right. So if I'm leveraging historical data, and maybe that historical data has to do with conversion from stage to stage. Let's make it really easy inside of a CRM, right? If I understand that my conversion top of funnel to a discovery call is this, and my conversion from discovery to demo is that, and my conversion demo to whatever happens down further in later stages is the other, then I know the volume of activity that I need, which then correlates back to what we were saying before of what do I need to do today? So if you can't extrapolate from the systems that you're using enough intelligence that allows you to understand the activity necessary, then you've got a problem. And that problem can only be solved through some of the things that Nick started the whole conversation out with, with respect to data hygiene, data management, data controls, etc., and ensuring that that stuff is um, impactful. The other thing that you're looking for here from a management perspective is what are the leading indicators for my metrics? right? It's not enough to just come and report at the end of the quarter. I can't tell you how many times I'm talking to C-level individuals who come and say, you know, I don't know what happened. We had a forecast. We had a number of different meetings. And then suddenly 11th hour, we're at the end of the quarter and we didn't hit and we missed by this huge chasm. We should have known this ahead of time. You know, it's as simple as, you know, one, one easy tell is looking at a CRM. And if, you as an IC or your team as a manager has the 30th or 31st of every month as the day that a deal is going to close. That's probably not accurate, right? I doubt you were talking to your prospect that they said, yes, 
All, all, all 16 of my prospects are closing on the 31st. Probably not true. Probably just a person ticking a box because they've got to fill in the Salesforce field. Or, sorry, it's the CRM of choice field. <laughs> let, 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 let's be agnostic there. Um, so anyway, that's the goal, right? Single source of truth. Make sure that you're creating uh, fields that are actionable and that, that provide data that you can leverage into reporting. Make sure you're making some sort of a hypothesis and evaluating that data going forward. Look for leading indicators, and that allows you to pivot directionally in anticipating either market challenges or challenges to your own business. Yeah, I love that. And there's a question in the chat, like, how do you measure the quality of the activities or anything that kind of ties into the quality of your data, which you kind of just hit on the head, right? If you as an executive or a manager, like can't really derive those outcomes or the impact of what's happening in your data sources. And you're like, Hey, at the end of the quarter, how did this happen? Or you're looking at your data input and every deal is closing the 31st. Like you probably have a data quality issue (laughs) where you're starting to think about it. Right. And I think that's one of the things that we really help our customers do is, is again, break it down. Right. So the quality of your data is as good as the activities that your team is driving. Then what do you do with that, those activities, or how do you kind of come up with that story of, okay, if we do this and we continue on this path or this scorecard, what are our business outcomes going to be? And if you feel like you're going to come up short, going back to those motivation tactics of, hey, am I like sharing the data with my team enough? Do they know where we are? Am I like hitting on each piece of that to motivate them to, you know, to push to that outcome? And I think Gretchen also calls this out with, you know, pipeline health is her jam, which I totally can relate to. And I think so many of you from a customer standpoint can as well is, you know, if your pipeline isn't accurate, those close dates, the next steps, the stages, you have no mm-hmm. idea what's going on with your ICs. And it's impossible to step into every single deal and make sure that it's accurate. So pushing that, you know, pipeline health data accuracy, I think really will help the quality overall. And I think when your team misses and you're calling that out and you're trying to coach them on that, that kind of motivates the individual as well to say like, oh man, I got to change something up um, for sure. <laughs> Nick, anything to add to that, that you, you know, whether you're using the data or you push your team to use data that you think is really helpful that we haven't touched upon yet? Yeah, I think it's kind of a mix of that um, the account score that we've recently kind of been leveraging with the intent information that we're getting, um, plus obviously that close loss loop, leveraging sales navigator and the intent that you can see in there. Um, so that'll be really low hanging fruit um, for us to leverage. Um, yeah, and then obviously knowing where you, where you stand day to day on that. But yeah, you definitely want to keep it clean. Um, and one thing I always stress is that when it comes to your daily activities, um, you want it to be consistent across the board. Because um, if you're going from like 100 to down to 40, then maybe up to 120 and then back down, like at the end of the month or the end of the quarter, whether you exceed it or maybe you fell short, you're not going to know what levers to pull if, there's, if there hasn't been consistency. Because um, that way you can really get into the data and say, like, okay, well, you had a lot of success um, on social. Maybe, maybe we want to leverage that a little bit more. Um, so that way you can help, your, help the reps know what levers they need to pull on, on either side of whatever channel seems to be producing the most, most success. Yeah. I think... Gretchen is definitely hot on this topic and sharing some of the things that she's looking at, which is amazing. And I think the 80-20 rule that she mentioned is um, is great, right? Like, you know, 80% of the time you want a clean pipeline, but, you know, 20% of the time, you know, you might have those outliers that you need to help your team clean up, which I think makes total sense. Um, I think, you know, from a coaching standpoint, Hillman's definitely worked with so many organizations to help drive behavior. And I know you've talked about that. But how do you think about like the transparency into deal progression while focusing on that like reliability? I know, you know, you mentioned some things that you're looking at, but is there anything else or like tips and tricks for the managers or even for the ICs that you can think about? Like, how do you use this data, these behaviors, the activities, like how do you tie it all together so you do know where you may land at the end of this year? Yeah, I'll tell you, my my answer to that is don't do tips and tricks. Um, there's it, it really the, the answer in my mind is that you've got to instill methodology because methodology creates consistency of structure. It creates consistency with respect to the metrics and data that you're looking at. 
It allows you to inspect the things that you're in- expecting. If Dana is running, um, you know, her own sales way of doing things and Nick's got his, you know, Nick 24 six way that he goes and does his calls and Hillman is using something like medic and it's combined with Bant and some Frankenstein, something else is from a management perspective, th- there's no control. Right. And there is no insight and there is no transparency because there's been no rigor and therefore there can be no accountability. The other thing that is absent there is I can't coach 16 different people on their own little way of doing stuff. Right. So the idea here is not to, you know, snip people's wings or to um, tamp down authenticity, but instead to identify as an organization. This is how we're this is how we're going going to market. This is how we are going to manage our sales process. This is how we have identified we most effectively navigate calls. This is These are the pain questions that we use to uncover pain. This is how we end calls so that we get velocity into the next step. Um, all of these different mechanics that I'm sure folks who are, who are on the webinar already understand, but distilling them into things that work in a really important way, and that is there's a tactical level of execution, which is me on the phone as a salesperson, And then there's this thing that's happening in the organization at even the board level or the management level, which is the strategy for how we're going to market. And maybe we're going upstream. Maybe we need to increase ACV or ASP or who knows what the objectives are for your organization. And often there's a real disconnect between the two. And the disconnect exists because sometimes in that tactical execution, it's a little bit of a black box. So what you need to do is to be able to open that through the use of both sales process, sales playbooks, and sales methodology, so that there is a clear lens bi-directionally, so that I, on my calls and in my conversation with a prospect, understand the objectives of the organization strategically. I also understand tactically the skills I need to employ to be able to pull that off, right? And then at the level of management or leadership, I can clearly listen to a call, review the CRM, whatever it might be, and get insight into whether or not our strategic objectives are actually being carried out on a tactical level. That's where, you know, you asked where where do we do a lot of our work, right, on the closed loop side. That's where we come in and make that transparency key. And that's where you create this cohesive means of being able to unite the organization around data and execute really impactfully that gives you competitive advantage. Amazing. I love that. I love don't do your own thing, right? I think sometimes as a seller, when you're not feeling the results or not as successful or even as, as an SDR, I'm going to veer off the path and maybe try this, right? And yeah. it does make you it. You'll link in and you'll get the latest it. tip, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's really yeah. valid. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Like I'm struggling with this. What does LinkedIn say? Exactly. Um, but I love that to kind of stay consistent there. We do have five more minutes. So we definitely have time for questions. And as you guys kind of think about what those may be, Um, We did put together, and I'm sure we'll share this after, but just, you know, a recap of some of the things that we did speak about um, for, I know we just said no tips and tricks, but these are more of our highlights. I guess we should change it to the top highlights um, (laughs) when you're thinking about your goals, but consistency is key. I love that everyone really focused on like the 1%, the at-bats, the small little repeatable behaviors that you can do. I mean, that's something that at sales screen, we really help our customers think about. And, and it goes such a long way with your bottom line with creating accountability, love the coach approach. I'm also a sucker for a good acronym. So love that Hillman included this, um, but identifying the challenge, making sure you're encouraging everyone, you know, their own path to success, their own action plan based on their skills, understanding what's going to happen if you don't hit that plan and then really holding yourself accountable because you know you've set it up for the individual. I love that part of this. And then just really thinking about your strategy, right? You know your business, you have the single source of truth, trying to keep everyone together, right? Keep it simple, not having so many people doing their own things. We all talked about data. Um, Gretchen had some amazing hits here too, like just things that she's looking at, the scorecard, the 80 20 rule, all of that. And then I think for everyone, you know, focusing on what you can control and remembering that, you know, the end of year is crazy. There's a lot going on. But again, those small at bats are really focusing on your own skill set is something that's totally within your reach that you can do to maintain that consistent activity pipeline and really crush it in 2022. Um, so let me know if anyone, I think we have enough questions. Um, Daniel gives Gretchen a rock the house. That was amazing. So thank you for your thank active you. chats. It doesn't look like there's anything right now, but our contact information will be shared. If you guys think of anything afterwards, this um, webinar was recorded, so you'll get it, but happy to help or have additional conversations if that comes up, but 
cheers to 2022. I can't believe it's almost over. It's insane. <laughs> um, and crush Q4. And hopefully this was helpful for you all. And thank you to Nick and Hillman for all your secrets and tips and tricks and just being great co-webinar panelists. It was amazing to have you. Thank you, Dana, Savannah, Nick. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everybody for being here and for all of you for joining us um, and sharing your insight. Um, we've got some fun events coming up next week. We've got Science of Selling, How to Hit New Levels of Sale Efficiency. That's on Tuesday. And then next Thursday, we've got an open discussion on the wage gap driven by race and gender for Black women. It's equality uh, pay day. So be sure to tune in on those and we look forward to next week. Thanks, everybody.